The Song of Seven, detailing the lives of the first seven monarchs of House Sevenstar, from Enger the First, the Father, to Lister the First, the Architect, written by Maester Damon of Andalia, himself Blood of the Stars, read by Grand Maester Stitch, member of the Conclave of the Mask and Rod of Copper, formerly of the House of Grand. Enger the First, Forging of a King. Enger, the conqueror, the father, the founder. We have many an epithet for this great king. A strong but rash man who carved a kingdom, but ironically, we know little and less of his childhood. However, we do know that he and his twin sister, Jonquil, were born 6587, or as I will insist on putting, 23 years before Enger's landing. Though it is how we date today in Andalia, it is clear to be a misnomer, for thousands of years would pass before Enger's great-great-great-grandparents were conceived. Alas, they were born to the petty landed knight Lennox, Knight of the Seven Stars. Named so for his piety and his morning star that had seven jagged spikes protruding from it, his lands residing on the west coast of Andalos, a windset place with a dreary sept at its centre. His mother, whose name has been lost to history, was said to be a most pious woman, and she had installed it into her son and daughter. Perhaps this could be the source of Enger's contempt towards his baseborn half-brother Harold, who later took the house name of Blackstar, having been born in the year 21 before Enger's landing. A large and lustly lad by all accounts, whose mother was baser born than her son, a farmer's daughter with jet black hair that she passed on to her son, which made his typical seven-star blue eyes even more striking. Not that they were known to be seven stars at that point in time, it would take many years before Enger took up that mantle and all that it entailed. Not that this stopped Enger's mother in her duty, her pride wounded yes, but by all accounts she did what was needed. She carried on her duty as a wife by presenting Lennox with another son, a boy named Owen born 15 years before Enger's landing, his two siblings eight years his senior. In accomplishments, the three siblings were never equal, however, with Enger outshining both of his kin, though their impact is still heavily debated. We cannot visit the rest of Enger's story before we visit what happened across the narrow sea, in the cold, desolate north. A land where the wolves howled as vigorously as the wind, and where there is howling, the pack are never far behind. And in the tale of Enger's seven star, this was what forever shaped him. Huger of the Hill had prophesied a new home for the Andals in Westeros. They had found it. The most notable at this time being Artis, the Falcon Knight who had gathered all kings of the Vale behind him and smashed the host of the Bronze Kings, taking the Vale and giving birth to the Falcons of Arryn. But this is a tale for another time. As the Vale had been taken, many others had crossed the narrow sea in different lands. The Grands carved their land out in the Blackwater Rush and raised the city of Grandport, but many more followed. But one land remained untouchable. Dozens of Andals had tried to tame the wildlands of the north, but all failed. Most notable was Argus Sevenstar, not to be confused for kin to Enger. Theon Stark managed to beat back Argus and his men, then did what no one else had dared before. Uniting the north, King Theon sailed his own army to the Andal homeland for vengeance, slaying hundreds upon thousands of Andals, not just men, but the women and children too. When he returned home, he planted their heads on spikes along the coasts of the north, a warning to other would-be conquerors, but that is a brisk oversight, for his retaliation would have a thunderous effect. One of the villages attacked belonged to Lennox, though the man was away, as was Enger, who was squiring under his father, as they fought against the dragon lords to the south. The Northmen stormed the village, killing burning, looting and raping in a frenzy of horror and savagery. It is reported that Enger's mother hid her children and even her husband's bastard, covering them while they hid under the pulpit of the dreary sept, protecting them until the end. It is said she was then impaled. Her sacrifice was to spawn perhaps the greatest dynasty ever seen on the shores of Westeros, all born out of her death and the retribution that followed. When Enger returned and saw what happened, he swore vengeance upon the hungry wolf. Such is the duality of war. Innocent or guilty, we all bleed alike, with Enger purportedly wailing to his father. What crime, I ask you? What did she do? 
I swear this, father. I will have vengeance on this coward who dares to strike while our men are away. This craven who slew women and children. This weakling who defiled our land. I will come for the same. I will not just defile his lands. No, I shall take them. This I promise you, father, with the gods as my witness. What may have been a boy's desperate cry at the time became a prophetic oath that all Northmen would fear in years to come. It was after the loss of his wife that Sir Lennox retired from his spurs, hanging up his saddle to oversee and protect his land. This left his son Enger wanting more. He was made for more than butchering sheep and he knew this. He broached the situation with his father and his father had a fitting answer for Enger. Lennox had been fighting for decades and in that time he had met a plethora of worthy knights, but one stood out, Boris Roseheart. Although not the brightest, he was possessed of great skill and without a doubt what made him stand out to Lennox was his tremendous size, a giant. That would surely linger in the mind when looking for a fitting educator for your son in the martial ways. So it was settled. Enger left a squire this night, a champion of the Andal Kings of Seven Rivers. It must also be noted that Lennox, Knight of the Seven Stars, fought for these self-same kings, so the placement seemed only natural. Enger got to live at court in a splendorous palace. He was tutored by the men of the court in more than skill at arms. It is said that he learned how to win Andalia in Tawny and sleeping in inns and under hedges, but learned how to rule it in the Seven Rivers, home of the Andal kings of House Capold. During his time here with Boris, he struck a fast friendship with the big knight's son, Stefan, another giant whose prowess made Enger look like a fool. Soon their duels brought crowds of onlookers. Enger, with his flowing golden hair, was quicker, it must be said. But that's not to discount Stefan's speed. His speed in comparison to his size was extraordinary. And his strengths, gods he was strong. There were tales of young Enger frustrating his friend with ribbed jokes, so Stefan picked him up without a qualm and placed him in a tree, leaving Enger stranded some 30 feet in the air. The two knights had become the talk of the court. Enger charmed the ladies with his pretty eyes and dazzling smile, and by all reports indulged these ladies. There is some talk of a bastard, though these reports can be discounted. Enger had a distaste for bastards, and it would be unlike him to conceive one given what we know of his character. And Stefan, a boy, yes, but he made the men look silly, beating them into submission. But this duo would not yet be complete. It is believed to be around the year 8 before Enger's landing that Danies Upton and Kristen Bloom were to arrive at court. Kristen was very tall and lean, but a shorter man than the tower in Stefan, but he was ferocious and unforgiving. It is said he was closer with Enger's twin than Enger himself. And Danies didn't have a disdain for sword and lance, but it was recounted that this group of friends were a four-headed lion, three with their teeth snarled and one with his head in a book and counting coppers. I will leave it up to your imagination who the head counting and reading belongs to. Two additional years would pass with no mention of Enger nor his comrades, but it would be the year six before Enger's landing at the age of seventeen that Enger would earn his knight spurs. In an act of sheer bravery, the Kingdom of Seven Rivers had just left the icy grips of winter, and it was the custom of that royal house to move between places depending on the season, and in spring and summer they would reside in their capital. A splendid city of pale yellow stone, a testament to Andal masons and architects, and during the court's move back to the capital, they were set upon. Not by Valerians or anything of the sort, an Andal scouting party who had grown so desperate and lacking any ships to cross the sea turned against their own. Valeria was engulfing the southern reaches of Andalos, and these men in their distress turned against their own. One arrow flew at the capold air, taking him clean in the throat, killing him as he slumped from his horse. A tragic event, but more Andal princelings would have faced the stranger if it wasn't for Enger and his entourage. They galloped up a steep chalky hill to cut down these lost souls, I would name them. An arrow would graze the cheek of Enger, leaving him with a scar, but that was all. The first of many a scar Enger would receive, he took to naming them my trophies. Despite this, these men were cut to pieces. As a result, the grieving king who knew despite his loss he could have lost so much more, bestowed knighthood on Danes, Kristen, Stefan and Enger, with a darkened blade of Valyrian steel. Alas, these four boys were made men by their bravery. It was an attestation of what was to come. The year that would follow would be the height of Enger's adolescence, as day by day he grew into a man. He was noted to have won one or two tourneys. 
The ones Sir Stefan didn't compete in, that is, and he did not frequently miss tourneys, so more often than not it would be the second place laurel for Enger. One such occasion, Enger had won and named the Princess Mordain Kapal the Queen of Love and Beauty. She was a beauty by all accounts, and said to be Enger's true love. Enger had gained the respect of the king, and Mordain being a third-born daughter, an eighth-born child, the youngest of the Kapal royal brood, he had offered her his hand. They were not to be wed for some years, however, at the time of betrothal, Mordain was but thirteen and a half. It must be noted that she had bloomed early and was wise beyond her years by all accounts. But these days of tranquillity would not last. This was Essos at the zenith of Valyrian power, and the Andalian subcontinent had drawn blood in skirmishes in the south, and where there is blood, sharks cannot be far behind. They came, the year four before Enger's landing. Enger, aged 19, was given the left flank, but not the command outright. The Kapowd king, who had grown too fat to fight in his grief for his son, had gorged himself. He commanded from his litter, his fat fingers pointing commands as if he was playing Shivas. But it would be here that Enger really made a name for himself. Sir Stefan led the charge from the vanguard. The Andals could count themselves lucky there were no dragons afield. The majority of fighting men came from Pentos, who are indifferent fighters it must be said, favouring Crossbow and Dirk, preferably poisoned. We have a detailed recounting of this battle, a brutal bloody affair ever known as Red Roin. It was fought at the base of the River Roin, so bloody it turned red for leagues. We go now to Lord Stephen Rosehart, then merely a sir, but in his later days he wrote a testimony transcribed by Maester Tion, the Maester at the White Star who eventually went on to become a member of the Conclave, his rod and mask of black iron, and it is to him we turn now. Ah yes, I remember that morn. Our army had the better ground, aye. We had some 6,000 men. 900 of them mounted knights. We entrenched at the top of a hill, with the Roiner, or the beginnings of it, cascading down so turbulently it made our white knife look a puddle. But yes, alas, the king, Arlen, no, Eldrick, I believe his name was. A gargantuan man he was, lad. Huge. Jested his hand to begin the charge, but he was so fat you could barely see his body, his weight sinking him into his litter. So all you saw was a hand waving regally. But with that ham hock's wave, we charged a thunderous charge. I didn't have the command of the centre. That lay with the king, a master of sorts, watching his apprentice and pointing where he wanted his men to go and die, safely from his litter. We met the narrow Pentoshi host, some 14,000 to our best count, slamming into them with great success. I ordered our horse to wheel and turn to strike again. Travesty. They pulled up wooden spikes, cutting our centre's horse from its foot. I was rash back then, even more hot-headed than King Enger. Well, he was just Enger back then, back when I could still hit him, without losing a hand. That was the worst thing about his coronation. Anyway, back to the battle. I charged nonetheless, the rest of my horse following me to the last. They were all impaled, their horses that is, and it created a new wedge of armoured foot slogging against these pentoshi bastards. I took a mace to the knee however, it looked as if I were destined to die, quite dramatically I must admit. I reached out my arms to the gods and screamed, River Roiner, receive my blood. And as the pentoshi horse burred down at us, I closed my eyes, and bang! Enger in his flank that had routed his foe clattered into the Valyrian horse, led by some son of a magister. He saved my life as I grasped for air. I saw Enger wheel back and ride at the commander known as the Silver Rider. The Valyrian had some Valyrian steel blade at hand, and Enger bore a chipped and ruined short sword, ruined by the brutal battle. The Valyrian's horse balked and the two horses collided, leaving the two warriors afoot. The champion's laurel that Mordain had given him cascaded to the ground in a cruel foreshadowing of what was happening back home, but more on that later. Enger circled this Valyrian, and as he rushed him, Enger stepped aside, taking the man's leg clean off. He roared like those dragons they loved to fuck, and he screamed, Mother! Mother! And Enger looked at him and said, I'll send you to the true mother. May she have mercy on you as he drove the point of the Valyrian's own sword through his throat. He held the sword aloft. It was indistinguishably the commander's blade. It was as if he cut the head off the snake. The Pentoshi cowards fled at the sight of their fallen commander by the thousands. To their credit, however, the Valyrians fought on and we drove them into the river, which had turned a startling red. It was at the end of this butchery that a rider appeared calling for the king. 
He had left his litter strutting about, claiming his victory. Yet, he had done nothing. He then had a message whispered in his ear. He fell to a knee, screaming in anguish like a wounded beast. We had been gone for two months. Two months too long. We should have known that the absence of dragons wasn't fortunate. The Valerians reduced the Yellowstone city to ash and everyone inside it. All his people, all his sons and daughters, including Mordain. That night was the first and last time I saw Enga, soon to be Seven Star, weep. This battle had been two steps forward and a thousand back for Enga. He had won the admiration of the men, he had single-handedly won this battle, but the war was ever ebbing one way, and no songs were sung that day. Some 8,000 Pentoshian Valerians lay dead, their corpses stagnate the ruinous this day, and good riddance. My own brother Hilario is a Valerian, for all his faults he is a kind man, but to this day the Valerian cruelty is remembered, and it stains him too, and it pains me to say it, it stains him rightfully. Curse those Valerian dogs. Anyway. Back to Sir Stefan. On our return to the burned city, Enger and I spoke of his boon, somewhat solemnly. I asked him that shiny new toy of yours, what will you name it? That man, the silver-haired rat, he begged for his mother, begged for mercy, and I gave it to him. This here is mother's mercy, he said, throwing the blade from one hand to another. I'll need to remodel it, don't you think, Steph? It stinks of Valeria. I will not sheave it until it runs red as the river did with Valyrian blood. This I promise you, my friend. And he didn't lie. In the years left we had in Andalos, Enger expressed his anguish through killing Valyrians. And he always got that look in his eye. When that man's blood was up, he almost frightened me. Me. And remodel it he did. The blade was dark even for Valyrian steel. This blade was queer. Nigh on black with spodric dots and strands of Colbert running through it breaking through the clouds like the morning sky. The handle was dragonbone, but the king, ever indebted to Enger and forever loving him as a son, offered to remake the handle and the blade itself as Enger had wished. But Enger was taken by the dancing pirouettes of lightning that ran through his blade. Enger graciously accepted. The dragonbone handle remains to this day, but it is covered by a thick layer of black dragon hide. It must be noted that the dragon scale must only be from a hatchling who had perished of natural causes. Valerians hitherto never sell full-scale dragon scales, nor their bones, so for this reason, Mother's Mercy was all the more fascinating. The dragon leather has little ribbons of silver darting through it when the light catches it. The crossguard was that of two huge rubies shaped in dragon heads. They seemed a needless thing. They were posthumous and cumbersome. Enger had them both struck off, but such were the size of these rubies, he ordered them both recut into seven pointed stars. In the place of the bejeweled crossguard, he had a simple, elegant band of steel, its edges cut smooth with crevices running down each one. In the crevices were placed thin striplets of silver that cut through the black steel, much like the iridescence of the dragon scales. But the hilt is what caught the eye. The ore-inducing ruby, now cut in the shape of a seven-pointed star, sat centred in the black circular pommel. Only one. The other ruby was reserved for other purposes. This was a sword fit for a king, and with all of Eldric Capald's sons and daughters dead, his only heirs being third cousins, hitherto unknown to the realm, many called for Enger to be named successor. For his valour, and for the love our sweet princess bore him, and by all reports, King Eldrick was largest amongst these callers. Alas, it would never be, for dragons this way come. And come they did. The silver rider Enger had slew for Mother's mercy was none other than the nephew of the Archon, and as retaliation he unleashed all Valeria's wrath upon Andalos Hall. It cannot be said what Enger thought of this. He understood war, but nonetheless he hadn't needed to kill the silver rider, as history remembers him and he had retired to his chambers lost in grief for his Mordain. It wouldn't be until this challenge arose that he stepped back into the mantle. Enger never shirked challenges. Far before he was a king, it must be noted he was without peer, a prince amongst men. King Eldrick was even wont to call him my prince in practice. As Enger took command of his armies and marched them south, with a heavy heart, still it must be said. On this march south, he was met by a young man in loose-fitting armour on a grey garron, accompanied by a tall youth with black flaxen hair. It was his brother Owen and his half-brother Harold, 
who had stolen away from their father's lands, who was resigned to sit out this war, his fighting days he felt far behind him. Their meeting was not set down to our deepest regrets, but it is said that the younger boy wept to behold his elder brother, and Enger dutifully took his brother in his arms and gave a curt nod to Harold. Enger had some 20,000 men, the full might of House Capold and their vassals. In previous skirmishes, it was only King Eldrick's personal professional army that marched. A fierce opponent, all augmented in black steel, with scorpions for any would-be dragon riders. They met the horde of Valyrians on a sodden field under the torrential rain. It rendered their dragon's flames nigh on useless, but also the Andal horse was ineffectual in those conditions. Enger ordered they fight afoot. We have not much of an account of what followed. We can turn once more to Stefan Roseheart, but his recollection of this battle is somewhat muddied. This battle, if you could call it that, it was a slog, my boy. It was all fought afoot, with bowstrings too wet to fire. We had our scorpions, which were still functional, and thank the gods they were. Enger made some inspirational speech about how we will not be bent and how we won't be slaves. Nor ashes, I was hoping. The battle was a brutal affair. We were completely outnumbered. But the Valyrians are dismal fighters, better at fucking sheep, I fear. That's how they started, shepherds, I believe. But with every wave we beat off, another came, and so did the dragons. They banked and swooped, not many could use their flames. There were four at my best count. The largest of them could still set a fire, but the other three, much smaller, swooped down like gargantuan birds of prey, picking up men in their talons to drop them on our ranks in some savage artillery. No one knows who fired that bolt. You've heard of two birds with one stone, but some maniac took two dragons down. He fired a bolt that pierced through a small grey dragon's throat, and as it shrieked and bellowed on its tumble to the ground, it struck another, digging its claws into the face in desperation. They both fell. They both fell. The golden dragon, beautiful and huge. It was lying dead beside the grey. Both their bodies boiling as they convulsed their last. Seeing this, the other dragon lords lost heart and fled, leaving their arms and armour afield. Though this battle would have some effect on the future of what would become Andalia, Owen was first at hand. Prince Owen, should I say, only he wasn't then. The rider had impaled his own dragon in his fall, so the sword went unnoticed, it must have done, but he pulled the Valyrian blade out of this dragon, trying his best not to wretch. A short sword. He named it the Stranger. The lucky bastards, both of them had Valyrian blades, but I could see it in Enger's eyes then. He was never beaten, never. He would fight to the last, but you could tell he needed to find his adopted father's people a new land. Stefan's testimony is our best insight into this battle, but I think it's a misnomer to call Eldrick Enger's adopted father. Aye, he didn't see eye to eye with Lennox for lack of a better word. Enger was ever the mother's boy, but it does the grizzled knight a misjustice. Enger returned to the city only briefly. The Andals had accepted their fate. A council was to be held on the Andal coast. All lords and knights of the Capold lands and other close-by petty kingdoms were to attend with their armies. But Andalos's armies were spent, and Fat King Eldrick's men had almost all perished at the battle. And he was resigned to sink with this ship, my boy. Go in my stead. Put your case to the council. You will never be a Capold to my shame, but you could be something far, far greater. Go, with haste. It is said that Eldrick made a ribald bow at that, and said smirking, Your Grace. Enger knew his purpose. He'd need the people, the lords, the faith, all behind him, as well as a fleet, men, and the bank. Enger arrived at this city. It was said to be made of white chalky stone. His first stop was to the Sept, a magnificent edifice where all the lords and ladies and knights were crammed in. He was reserved a place of honour as the representative of House Capold, much to the cousin of the king's, Eustace's, annoyance. This is where we first encounter another of our sources, a certain Septon Hugo, Honey Tree. It is to him we turn now. As morning broke, more refugees flooded into the city. We greeted them with open arms, along with more representatives of royal houses. Although the two most notable in Capold and Iran sent proxies, Iran sent his three bastard sons, one still ten and five by my best guess, and Capold sent what seemed to be a what? A no one, a son of a landed knight with dry yellow hair like hay. I praise the seven that I couldn't be more wrong. 
This man, whose name I found out to be Enger, is Humus Leaders. I remember his father in some tawnies, the Knight of the Seven Stars. His son is an apostle sent down from the father and the warrior, surely. For when I began my prayers and all attended lords bowed to their knees in front of the altar, I thundered for a deliverer, and as I spoke these words, light shot in. Right at this anger, unbeknownst to everyone as they had their eyes shut, I had tears in my eyes as I lay hands upon his face, his blue eyes fixed upon me. It was as if the clouds had broken and sunlight shone onto me. He is here, this man will deliver us. He is beloved of the gods, here my lords, here is your king, here is our strength. I said, forcing him to his feet. He seemed somewhat confused, but not out of place. The pious heeded my words at once, of course, yet I did see some cynical lords titter amongst each other. Although our good Septon tells a compelling story, it is without question that Enger's character, not his divine providence, would make him someone all men wanted to follow. But with next to no effort, Enger had secured the faith, and he would prove his gifts be they temporal or mortal once again as we turn to Lord Stephen. We gathered in the great hall, seated on old wooden benches, a testament to Andalos's fading light, bickering how to best attack these dragon lords when Enger stood up. Such was his strength in tone, all listened. You wish to fight these dragons. My lords, have you taken leave of your senses? This is not a war we can win. You know of my exploits. You know me as no coward. Let us take our women and children to safety. Let us carve out new lands for our people. In the west it lays untouched by the dragon lords. Let us fight for a future, for a new home. Andalos is lost, but in our strength lies a new Andalos. It was at this point that the youngest of the Aram bastard kings of the Sweetwater spoke up. Aye, it is the course that must be set. The lands watered by the trident are numerous and plentiful. Let us set course there, so our children may see another day, so they may hold their own babes. That boy went on to become some petty king in the Riverlands, that tree house in Willowwood, but Enger sat down this boy with a snarl. What have these river lords done to us, boy? What do you know of war? It was amusing that the boy's two older brothers both clipped him on the head as if they knew the child was out of place. Enger went on then. Let us strive for a new home, yes, but for revenge. Theon Stark defiled our homes, let us take his. He lifted Mother's mercy into the air. It was a sword of kings undeniably. Though only a pious few named Enger such as of yet, they all thundered agreement, mailed fists in the air. There was some wisdom behind it also. It is known that the dragons can't bear the cold, and Enger surely knew this as he strode from the hall. It is said that some began to bend the knee, but the older lord saw nothing but an upstart. He still had some winning over to do. In doing this, he gathered the young ambitious lords to his cause, yet those old grey hairs still denied him. Enger knew he needed them, but he had secured the patronage of House Aran in his venture, and their considerable black-sailed fleet. Enger gained the faith of the people yet again by opportunity, although, unlike in the Sept, there was no divine intervention, just Enger's bravery. What one must understand is that these refugees had flooded a city, there was barely room to walk one abreast in the streets, and under these torrid conditions truculence finds a hovel to breed, and it came in the form of a pot-bellied Septon, Septon Archibald, who had insisted that the gods made men all eat and that we ought to tear down the feudal system, all while never offering a replacement, it must be noted. Furthermore, he and his band of sparrows were running around the city, persecuting sinners as they saw fit, while extorting the people of their gold and kind, not so pious of men, and preached against the Septon Hugor and his sept on the hill. It would fall to Enger to rectify this unrest, reaching out to agents through a certain herald, Enger's half-brother, ever working in the shadows that led Enger to this false Septon. Enger rode out his best knights and his squire Owen, and rode these unwashed barbarians down, spilling their blood into the gutters. Enger beheaded this Septon Archibald and left one quarter of him nailed to boards across the city, so that people need not feel afraid anymore. And for the first time, assuming the name of Seven Star, taking from his father's nickname Knight of the Seven Stars, to give him legitimacy and prop up his standing to be sure along with a sealed seven-pointed star in red matching the ruby on his blade, on a plain white background for his personal sigil. 
In a stroke of propaganda genius, he had won the people to his cause. Now all that was left was those old greybeards in the bank. But Enger planned to approach them as a king and nothing less. Enger was resigned to sail with or without them. With him recruiting enough men as it is, and the fleet was sizable, enough to carry some 10,000 men. Although he was not the sole leader, something he would desire, and something he would turn to the sept to assure his sole dominance. But Enger wasn't one to be defeated so easily as the Valyrians learned, so would the Greybeards. He earned their respect by duelling the foremost of these men's champion, Sir Wilbert Josso, a young man of 17 years famed for his exceptional skill with a shortened poleaxe. Enger took all of his blows on his shield, one after another. Enger's shield was battered, the once painted red star reduced to mere splinters, but he saw his chance and tripped the skilled knight and forced him to yield. The man rose laughing and raised Enger's fist. Here stands the first man ever to best me. Nods were exchanged along with sporadic slow clapping from the Grey Knights. It is largely debated to this day whether Enger had paid off Sir Wilbert. Some say that is not Enger's character, but it must be noted in the future when the two jeweled as Lord and Liege, Enger would forever be second to Wilbert, as would so many others, well, all but one. Now the bank. The bankers had no intention of leaving Andalos. They reasoned they had thick vaults, nothing could harm their gold nor themselves. Enger was keen to change that. He went with Kristen Bloom, Danies Upton and Stefan Roseheart to assuage their desire to stay. And it is to Stefan we turn once again. That bank was ponderous, huge even. It was built into a mountainside. It was a marvel, almost something out of a tale my grandmother would tell me, of men living deep in the earth mining gold. Or more familiarity, Castley Rock. Not that I ever seen the rock, so I suppose that's not so familiar. These bankers would not move. They were incredulous. Enger wasn't yet King Enger, but he was in practice. He was yet to be anointed by Septon Huger, but the bankers knew they were treating with a king and gave him every courtesy. There was a lot of back and forth, and Enger nearly stormed out. As he was leaving, he turned and said, Gold doesn't burn, no, but it does melt. Had you considered that? It fell to Danies to promise all trade from this new Andalos for 20 years would be provided to the bank or its surrogate in lease. Enger wasn't pleased to pay Valerians, but he swallowed his pride. He needed a loan to fight a war, to build a city. Enger left, his quick temper at boiling point, but he left a rich man. He had secured the bank. Now all that was left was his coronation. Then white windswept shores awaited. Only one other event would occur before his coronation. Enger would meet with his father and emotionally named him my shield, my guardian, my stall at right hand. So it is reckoned Lennox be the first king's hand. He turned to Stefan for his master of war and champion naturally. The man was war personified. But we turn to his quote from his testimony. Aye, I was good at killing, but I never liked it. Truth be told, I've not slept a full night since I was 14, or senseless with wine, or more recently, milk of the poppy. He turned to Danies Upton naturally for his master of coin, with Danies reportedly replying, I've been making sure you don't ruin yourself financially for years now. You and your wagering, and I hear they're letting you be a king. Gods be good. He supposedly said with a smile on his face. He next turned to his sister, who had an unparalleled knowledge of Andal law, and an easy grace that could charm the bitterest and most rigid of men. He named her mistress of law and high educator of this new realm of Andalos. His master of whisperers was none other than Harold Blackstar, the king's bastard half-brother. He had taken the name Blackstar as Enger took Seven Star. It must be noted, Enger wasn't pleased with this taking of a name. Lennox wasn't a Seven Star. He sullied the honour of his newly founded house, but Jonkle dissuaded him as she always did. His septum would be no one but Septon Hugo Honeytree, the man that was set to anoint him in the upcoming service, a slender man with thick sideburns as white as snow. And Perra Hornsby, no maester, was named Mistress of Health and Sustenance, and the title has survived to this day, though not often used. It is my own title in today's council sessions, though most call me Maester. Some call me Nuncle, and at one stage many called me Brother, due to the facilities of a certain nameless man who we will meet later in our story. Though the amorous adventure of one yet to be born has no bearing on our story as we return to Enger and his coronation. Alas, the day dawned and we turned to Sir Stefan once again as he recounts the day. Aye, 
I remember. That honey tree was raving about how the father protectors and the crone light our way. It would be steel that forged our path. I, the gods, were behind us, but ultimately, it was up to us. Enger approached the pulpit of the Sept and kneeled. A gold crown was placed upon his head, a rather unremarkable thing. This was until he looked up. The other ruby, the one he had taken off the silver rider, was cut and shaped in the fashion of the seven-pointed star. It was placed front and centre above Enger's brow. It glistened in the light as he addressed the assembled knights and the people outside. The doors were opened, and Enger positioned in a place so that all could see inside and out. We now turn to Pera Hornsby for the first time. She set down a copy of all of Enger's edicts. What he ate, how many times he visited the privy, I do believe she didn't miss a thing. We can be grateful for her lack of reticence. He began. Brothers. Sisters. It's time for the start of a new age for our people. We all know of the successes many of our people have had in the West, claiming lands and carving rich kingdoms out for themselves over these last few hundred years. But as our culture spreads in the West, our very home and freedom is disappearing before our eyes. The Dragon Lord's influence spreads. Most of the once mighty kingdoms of Andalus have fallen and have been enslaved. We will be next, mark my words. I do not mean to be a slave, and I do not mean to be burned alive. The time has come. It is our turn to cross the narrow sea to the new world. Everyone erupted in cheers then. It were as if the ground was shaking. I had to grab onto one of the seven stout pillars in the sept. Enger raised his fist to silence them. He always had mastery of any room he was in. We will go not to bow to our brothers, who have already taken lands though. We will carve out our own lands and kingdoms, in the untouched lands of the north. We will take revenge upon the savage wolf king who sailed to our lands and butchered our people. We'll kill their savage heathens, cut down their sacred trees, burn their false gods. The sept erupted once more. Come with me, my brothers, to take these lands, to allow our faith and our people to live on. They will sing songs of our bravery and our accomplishments for generations. He began to shout now at the top of his lungs, something a young Enger did quite often, mind. We will do what they said could not be done. We will become the Knights of the North. It truly erupted now. It was Jonquil and Owen, I believe, that stood up with Enger, their slim coronets ahead screaming Seven Star, Enger, and we all joined their cry. But I did worry this was too personal for Enger. He was already a rash man. I worried about what he may do, and where that may lead us. This occurred on the third of the first moon, 6610, or the year zero before Enger's landing, but is reckoned the beginning of Enger's reign and the source of what legend was to come.